This is the Yonkazine Brief with Peter Hoffman and Sonia Portillo. In this edition of the Oncogene Brief, we talk with some of the leading oncology experts who attended this year's annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, in Chicago, Illinois. The theme of this year's conference was Delivering Discoveries, Expanding the Reach of Precision Medicine. I'm Peter Hofland, here with Sonia Portillo, and this is the Oncogene Brief. This year's meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, held June 1st through 5th in Chicago, Illinois, focused on expanding precision medicine in oncology. But equally important, as you can hear in one of our interviews, the needs of the patients and for doctors to understand these needs is essential. ASCO, which is the world's leading organization of its kind, promotes the highest quality patient care through fostering research, education, and collaboration in oncology. At this year's 2018 meeting, nearly 40,000 attendees gathered to discuss the growing body of data on advanced, difficult to treat diseases that do not have many treatment options. One important aspect of this year's meeting was dealing with disparities in oncology. The importance of reducing gender, racial, and socioeconomic disparities in oncology was widely discussed. Several highly anticipated presentations dealt with racial disparities when treating black men and white men with advanced metastatic prostate cancer. A study presented on Saturday, June the 2nd, revealed that when black men and white men with advanced prostate cancer are treated with the same standard treatment for advanced disease, black men were more responsive and showed better results. However, in the United States, black men are twice as likely as white men to die from prostate cancer. Prostate cancer incidence rates are 60% higher for black men, and they are more likely to be diagnosed at a younger age. In the following interview, we speak with ASCO expert Dr. Robert Dreiker, who shared with us his perspective on this study and why providing equal access to treatment is key in reducing disparities in oncology. Let's listen to the interview. Dr. Dreiser, uh, here at the annual meeting of the American Society of uh, Clinical Oncology, the 2018 edition already. Um, There is a lot of exciting presentations. Um, One of the presentations is showing the results of a prospective clinical trial of 100 men with metastatic carcinoma-resistant prostate cancer um, and their response on uh, hormone treatment. Can you tell me a little bit about that uh, study, uh, what is unique about the study, um, and what the implications are of the results? Sure. This is a study of 100 men, half African-American, half Caucasian, and their response to the drug abiraterone, which is an approved drug around the world. What was interesting about this study was that historically, African-American men do worse in terms of survival with prostate cancer. But in this study, they responded not only just as well as the white men, but to some extent better. And that suggests that if you actually give appropriate therapy to African-Americans with advanced prostate cancer, they do well. So what is the implication of that? Well, I think there are two. One is this study was designed to address questions about some, from a biologic perspective, are there things that are genetically different that might explain why this drug may be more helpful in African-American men? But it also speaks to access to care. Uh, part of our problem in the U.S. is that African-Americans don't have the same access to care, but this shows if they do, they do just as well. Right. Yeah, that brings the question to, that's the question, um, when you look at clinical trials, Right, there's about four to five percent of people here in the U.S. participating in clinical trials on average. Um, if they, if you would take away the one study here showed at uh, ASCO, if you would take away the exclusion criteria, in some case it may be um, adding about one percent. A study from the University of Washington and, and Fred Hutchinson, I believe. Um, how? But how can we increase the participation of, first of all, patient population in general? Um, and how can we maybe increase the population of, of minorities, maybe black men, Hispanics, in this uh, case? This is a critical question, and if I had a perfect answer for it, I'd give it to you. But one strategy is to try to relax the inclusion criteria, make it more real-world-like. Meaning, that, you know, considering for comorbidities? Exactly. Uh, if we made it a little less restrictive, uh, although some that might complicate the studies, but it would likely make it more inclusive and perhaps increase the minority accrual. Right. 
Uh, how likely is that that you that we can really see that happening in, in the? I, I think there there's a movement to make this happen because I think there's a recognition that we need to do these kinds of studies, and as we begin to understand genetic and genomic differences, we have to do this kind of work. Right. So, talking about again about the clinical trials, um, there's another study that. Uh, shown here uh, also about prostate cancer that actually showed there was a pooled data from nine different studies randomized to phase three studies meaning that it is a, a drug that is probably going to a um, approval situation with phase three and beyond um, was a study with 8,000 men um, what was unique about that particular study? So unlike the first study, this is a retrospective analysis, as you point out. So it has some issues in terms of analysis. But what it showed us was that African Americans enrolled in these trials, and again, they were underrepresented in each of the trials. But right. when you pull them, African Americans responded to a chemotherapy drug, which is routinely available as well or perhaps better than white men. Again, suggesting that if you actually treat men, African Americans, with conventional therapy, they do well. So... Um, you said it's existing drug therapy? That's correct. These are studies that were built on a backbone of a chemotherapy called docetaxel, long available, trying to improve it. But what you can now do in a retrospective analysis is say, of the men who got this chemotherapy drug, including African Americans, how did they do compared to white men? And they did as well or better. Well, that's exciting to hear. Absolutely, because it means that if you just use the therapies that we have in unrepresented populations, they may do better. Right. That also comes to the question is if you look here at ASCO, um, and not only ASCO but other society meetings, often you see that there is an awful lot of attention um, about the latest and the newest and the most beautiful uh, things that are out there. We talk about targeted therapies, precision medicine. Uh, are we not forgetting sometimes that existing drugs are sometimes, in some situations, equally important to at least review, study, or revisit in cases of time? I think you're medicine. absolutely right. And I think one of the things about personalized medicine is it begins to give us access to understand that differences in genetic populations may have differences in responses to therapy. And that means old drugs, not just new drugs. Right. So that means that if we be able to do things like personalized or uh, personalized diagnostics or individualized looking at the patient as an individual before we go into prescribed treatments that may help in focusing on the outcome or helping patients to uh, I improve? I think that is unequivocally the future. I think that is broadly acknowledges that we need to move in that direction so that we optimize each individual patient's likelihood of response to whatever treatment they get. Okay. So, again, ASCO to 2018, other than these two very exciting trials, very interesting to see uh, the implications of that. What have you noticed otherwise in, in, in walking around here for a couple of days right now? So I'm a urologic oncologist, so I focus on urologic cancers. At the plenary session that's going to be starting here shortly, there's a study about the role of what we call cytoreductive nephrectomy, removing a kidney in a patient with metastatic disease in the era of modern treatment. And there's going to be some practice changing information provided there, so that's exciting. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. One thing I'm glad that Dr. Dreiker noted in his interview was the difficulty of gathering data over minority groups due to the underrepresentation of these groups in clinical trials. Even in the study, the underrepresentation of black patients makes it difficult to gather significant evidence on how race may affect prostate cancer treatment results. Studies such as the one Dr. Dreiker discussed highlight the importance of understanding barriers to enrolling a diverse population of patients in clinical trials. Okay, let's take a short break here, and then we talk some more. If you're just joining us, in this program, we review some of the exciting presentations given during the annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, held June 1st to the 5th in Chicago. After the break, we continue our review. I'm Peter Hofland. And this is the Younger Scene Brief. Clinical trials allow researchers to introduce new hope by providing participants access to cutting edge and potentially life-saving treatments. Speak with your doctor and visit standuptocancer.org slash clinical trials to learn more. Together, we can stand up for all of us. And welcome back. This is the Oncogene Brief. 
And if you're just joining us, in this program we are covering some of the exciting news and abstracts presented at the 2018 annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, which took place June 1st to 5th in Chicago, Illinois. The theme of this year's ASCO meeting was Delivering Discoveries, Expanding the Reach of Precision Medicine. And we are speaking to some of the leading professionals in the field of oncology who were present at this year's ASCO meeting. Let's go back to the program. Another study dealing with disparities in oncology dealt with differences found in treatment and outcomes for head and neck cancer in men versus women. This analysis of cancer registry data from a hospital system in California revealed that women with head and neck cancer were less likely to receive intensive chemotherapy and radiation when compared to men. The findings from the study raised the possibility that women with head and neck cancer may be undertreated. We interviewed Jed Katzel, a medical oncologist at Kaiser Permanente in Santa Clara, California, who's the senior author of this study. Let's listen. We're here with uh, Jed Katzel, and he is uh, from uh, Kaiser Permanente in California. Um, Dr. Katzel, if um, yesterday we were uh, listening to some of the presentations given about head and neck cancer, Tomorrow, Sunday, there will be uh, more information about uh, uh, head and neck cancer and some of the results that uh, um, you had with uh, uh, gender disparities in, in cancer, especially in this particular cancer. But before we're going to talk about that there in particular, if um, you are a patient, if you are maybe not a patient yet, um, and you worry about some of the things that may lead up to uh, head and neck cancer, some of the diagnostic things that Symptom the worries. What are some of the things people have to look at? Thank you very much, Peter, for this opportunity. Um, we're very excited about sharing our results at ASCO this year. Head and neck cancer is a really important topic. We know that the traditional risk factors for head and neck cancer are smoking and alcohol, but we also know that one of the emerging risk factors for head and neck cancer is HPV human papillomavirus. We previously did a study looking at demographic factors in Northern California, and we found that the rates, the incidence rates, for oral cavity cancer were fairly stable over time, and that was looking between 2000 and 2010 in a large population of patients in Northern California. However, we found that the rate, the incidence rate, for oral pharynx cancer, that's like base of tongue cancer and Mm -hmm. tonsil cancer, was rising. And that was had been seen in previous studies, but those previous studies were mostly single institution studies or smaller studies. So we were the first to show that on a population level that the rising incidence rate of oral pharynx cancer um, was, was happening on a large population level. And we know that that's related to this change in head and neck cancer related to HPV, human papillomavirus. At our institution, um, the rates of HPV-related head and neck cancer is in the 70 to 75% range for newly diagnosed oral pharynx cancer. That that means patients that come to the clinic and are newly diagnosed. For the first time, they they get a diagnosis of this cancer. That's correct. Um, If you... um now look at the people that are being diagnosed, the patients that are come in and you diagnose them. Um, one of the things we learned also here during ASCO is that there is a difference um, in um, what I said, the, 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 the difference between women and men, not only in being diagnosed, but also in the outcomes of treatment. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. That was some of the results that we got from this current study. And we were really um, interested to look at patients in Northern California to understand about intensive therapy. A lot of the treatments for head and neck cancer can be very difficult treatments. They can be very intensive and burdensome for patients. So we wanted to know if certain populations of patients would benefit from intensive therapy or if others would not benefit from intensive therapy. So we looked to this model which was a validated mathematical model called a generalized competing events model. Mm -hmm. And we used this model, or GCE model, to help us identify populations that are potentially undertreated or overtreated in clinical practice. 
And when we applied this to our large population of head and neck cancer patients that were diagnosed between 2000 and 2015, we found some interesting findings. In particular, um, we presented our data here, which is showing that women were more likely to die from head and neck cancer than from other causes. We also found that men were more likely to die from head and neck cancer than from other causes. However, when we compared women with men, we found that the ratio was nearly double for women compared with men. So that means that in this cohort of patients, um, on GCE analysis, which right. controlled for the stage of the cancer and the tumor location, that there was an increased risk for women to die from head and neck cancer than from other causes compared with men. And this was a new finding, and we look forward to really investigating this further to fully understand this difference. Now, when you look at the difference, and I mean, there may be a hypothesis in which we say, well, this may be a reason. You mentioned the fact that the treatment may be very intensive in some ways. Um, is that a reason why maybe women may say, well, I prefer not to be treated, or we have a slightly different approach to treatment? That's right. So two things come to mind uh, to answer your question. Um, one is that um, we looked specifically at treatments in our group. We didn't, not on the GCE analysis, but on another thing called the logistic regression analysis, looking at the types of treatment that patients received. And in our cohort, we did find that less women received intensive chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And to get to your question, we really will need further investigation, like a chart-by-chart -chart review or prospective analysis, to really understand why some patients may elect to have or to decline aggressive and potentially burdensome treatments. The other thing, which I think you were getting to as well, um, was on our GCE analysis. So getting back to that finding that we had regarding the differences between survival for women compared with men. The model we used was designed to account for tumor location and stage, but there was a statistically significant difference within our population that we should point out, and that relates to this oral pharynx cancer, kind of getting back to the HPV right. story we were talking about. In our group, in our cohort of patients, the rate of oral pharynx cancer for women was 38%. In our cohort, the rate of oral pharynx cancer for men was 55%, and that was statistically significant with a p-value of less than 0.001. Now, that's important. I'm not right. interrupting, but just to fin finish the story. And that's important because we know that HPV-related cancers most commonly occur in the oral pharynx, in the tonsils, and in the base of tongue. And we know that HPV-related head and neck cancer has a better prognosis and a better response to therapy. So what comes to mind when you are looking at HPV? Um, over the last decade, there is this uh, increased emphasis on vaccination in case of cervical cancer in, in related to HPV. Of course, that's a whole different set of cancers, nothing to do with this particular form of cancer. But does that protect people in this particular case as well, or is that too far-fetched to say that if they are protected in one way, um, they may have a diminished risk of getting a different form of cancer, like head and neck cancer in this particular case? It, it's not exactly what we studied in this trial, but I would say about vaccinations in general, we're very hopeful that vaccinating both men and women, boys and girls, right. will help to prevent head and neck cancer in adults. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks. Let's take a short break here. If you're just joining us in this program, we review some of the exciting news about the new developments in the diagnosis and treatment of cancer that were presented during the annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, or ASCO, which was held June 1st through 5th, 2018 in Chicago. After the break, we'll continue our coverage of the 2018 annual meeting. I'm Sonia Portillo, and this is the Oncozine Brief.
And welcome back. This is the Oncuzine Brief, and if you're just joining us, we're covering some of the exciting news and abstracts presented at the 2018 Annual Meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, which took place June 1st through 5th in Chicago, Illinois. We're interviewing some of the leading professionals in the field of oncology who are present at this year's ASCO. Our final interview during this week's program is with Dr. Kimberly Blackwell, the Vice President of Early Phase Development and Immuno-Oncology at Lilly Oncology. During this year's ASCO meeting, data from 30 oral presentations, poster presentations, and e-publications underscored Lilly Oncology's focus on making a meaningful difference in the lives of people living with cancer through clinical development and collaboration. We spoke with Dr. Blackwell about the Monarch studies presented by Lilly that evaluated a new drug to treat different patient subgroups of women diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. Dr. Blackwell explained the significance of these results. She also mentioned the company's focus on understanding and serving the needs of women with disease characteristics that are typically associated with less favorable prognosis. And she shared with us how doctors can better understand these clinical characteristics, which may help them optimize treatment for treatment decisions for women with advanced disease. Let's listen. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Blackwell. And I hope you're enjoying your weekend here at the annual meeting of the American Society for Clinical Oncology, in short, ASCO. Hopefully you've had the opportunity to listen to some lectures and see some of the poster presentations this weekend. So what are some of the presentations and abstracts that you have found most exciting this year? Well, um, at this year's meeting, I think we saw a lot of data as it relates to the use of CDK inhibitors for the treatment of metastatic breast cancer and as a, a card-carrying breast oncologist, I'm always interested in, in what is becoming or what is establishing itself as a standard of care. And so, you know, to see confirmatory data about how CDK inhibitors are really prolonging the benefits of, of, of baseline endocrine therapy is very important. So we saw data from the Monarch II study in premenopausal and perimenopausal women showing uh, you know, a, a significant benefit in prolonging disease progression when the CDK inhibitor was added on top of an endocrine therapy backbone. We've started to see some cell-free DNA signals to look at um, markers of women who derive larger benefit from the use of CDK inhibitors, and I think that kind of dovetails into some of the other cell-free DNA work we've seen um, presented at this year's meeting. Now, You've mentioned breast cancer, which you've had a lot of experience in. And at this year's ASCO, Lily is presenting a data from the trial you mentioned, Monarch. So first off, can we talk about the patient population that's being treated and the characteristics of the patients in this trial? Yeah, so in the Monarch II study, it was a population of women facing metastatic or recurrent breast cancer that was hormonally driven or estrogen receptor positive. And this trial design was, you know, pretty straightforward, um, it involved a fulvestrin endocrine therapy backbone with or without the use of a bemaciclib, which is an oral CDK4-6 inhibitor that's approved both as a single agent and in combination with endocrine therapy. And what we're starting to see and what we've known for some time is, is that younger women facing breast cancer sometimes have a, a more rapid course. Their disease is perceived as a little bit more aggressive. And so asking the question, do the CDK4-6 inhibitors benefit younger, meaning premenopausal, perimenopausal women, as much as the postmenopausal, which are older women? And what we saw is that these women that were in the pre-perimenopausal range derived the same amount of benefit as we saw from the total intent-to-treat population, meaning both, I have to be careful not say young or old, but younger and older women um, versus postmenopausal, and what we what we actually saw was is that there was a continues to be a significant benefit in this younger set of women facing metastatic breast cancer for the use of CDK inhibitors. Can you be a little more specific and give us some of the results of Monarch that you presented this weekend? Yeah, well, so I actually didn't present the study. So um, Lilly Oncology sponsored the study that was presented over the weekend, and what it basically showed was a hazard ratio that um, was significant in favor of the benefit of adding the CDK4-6 uh, abemaciclib. And um, probably more importantly, we saw that it delayed the time to needing chemotherapy, which I think is a very 
meaningful endpoint for women facing metastatic breast cancer. And we're starting to understand that, as with any medication, there are side effects, and the side effects associated with CDK4-6 inhibitors um, include GI side effects such as diarrhea and neutropenia, which is a lowering of the white blood cell count. Now, you have a background as a physician, and now you're a vice president at Lilly, and the company is also expanding the research and development team with new hires from leading medical institutions. So in your own case, how does having that firsthand experience in treating patients and dealing with them and their families help you in your current role, and how does your experience bring help to Lilly in developing better therapies and really putting the patient first when it comes to cancer? Well, I think it helps in a number of ways. I think... For me, the way it helps me on a day-to-day basis is recognizing that our patients deserve and need better treatments, and that's probably why you're seeing this large um, group of previously um, academic physicians joining pharma, not just Lilly, but other companies, because what we see is a potential to make a, to build on our skill set that we've developed. I I've, I've took care of patients for 26 years. I understand what the unmet needs are. I understand what delivering um, quality care is. And I understand what it really means to develop high-impact medicines for people facing cancer. And so our, you know, not just me, but Mar Dickler and Lena Gandhi, who have all recently joined Lilly or will be joining Lilly Oncology, along with our most senior leadership, such as Levi Garraway, We all were in the trenches. We all understood what a really good new drug was versus a drug that just kind of added very little. It might have added something. And that that remains um, one of our foundational goals that I carry with me as I join Lilly, which is we want drugs that make a big impact. They're not small, but they're really game-changing medicines that will make an impact for patients facing cancer. Earlier this week, we were actually invited to to an event organized by your company called Portraits of Resolve, and I must say it was really impactful, emotional look into um, a patient's experience and a patient living with cancer and their thoughts and what goes through their head. So how important is it for you as a vice president and as a physician to understand what patients living with cancer are going through? Well, it's super important to understand and bring that perspective to everyone that works at Lilly Oncology, that this is... Um, I don't know if this translates very well, but I, I, I used to say this all the time in my old, ac- I mean, we're not working for Burger King here. What we do here, impact, no, no offense to Burger King, or you could name another fast food chain, but really this is, I mean, these are people's lives. And, you know, when we talk about three months, you know, improvement and progression-free survival, um, I love um, Levi Garraway puts it in terms of that's a whole nother season. That's a season of football to be with your family, or that's a, you know, three more holidays that people would not have been able to experience had we not made that incremental benefit. So I, I think bringing the patient and putting the patient forward should be um, a goal for all pharma and all physicians working in drug development. And even at this year's ASCO meeting, what we're seeing is a huge patient presence, and you know, um, especially in the metastatic arena, where patients now that, that they're living longer facing metastatic breast cancer, they're really developing a voice to say, we need to have a role in how we judge new medicines and how these new medicines are developed, and we can help. We can give you tissue samples. We can contribute our time above and beyond what we've traditionally asked patients to do when they participate in a clinical trial. Walking around here at ASCO, there's a lot of talk about real-world data, and when it comes to clinical trials specifically, and that has in part to do with the FDA mandate that it's important to understand new drug therapies in patients that closely represent patients an oncologist may see in his or her practice. How important is this approach for Lilly and for you? Well, we think real-world evidence is going to be um, very, very important in helping us understand the role that our newly approved agents play, as well as the potential role that our agents in development will play. And we've, you know, we've seen, even at this year's meeting, some data from the prostate cancer world that, you know, um, uh, anti-androgen medicines work different just based on racial populations. And so, you know, racial populations need to be examined in the context of a clinical trial where 
then we can add real-world data and make certain that it's broadly applicable to the benefits that our drugs bring to patients facing cancer. After a break, we'll continue our coverage of the annual meeting. Now let's go back to the Monarch trial and or Monarch two. Mm-hmm. So you you really you focused on patients that have a really hard to treat disease and that have unique characteristics to their disease. So how does understanding these different characteristics in cancer help oncologists in treating patients with very advanced diseases? Well, I think it actually helps with the dialogue. So you know, very practical subset analysis like we did with Monarch 2 that was presented at this year's ASCO really helps physicians have a meaningful, fully informed discussion with patients. There's trade-offs with every medication, and there's benefits with every medication. And so, you know, it's it seems like a very reasonable question a patient should ask, has this drug been shown to work as well for me as a 42-year-old facing breast cancer as a 60-year-old facing breast cancer? And that's the types of analysis that we saw, especially with Monarch 2, helps inform physicians and patients in making decisions about what is the benefit versus what is the risk. Here at ASCO, immuno-oncology has been a really hot topic now and in the past few years. So where where are you with immuno-oncology and where is the company headed in, in that space? Well, I mean, Lilly Oncology is committed to developing and examining drugs in the immuno-oncology space. But just like we saw 20 years ago in the HER2 trastuzumab space, what we've seen is this initial wave of success with checkpoint inhibitors. And we certainly hope that that success will continue with other checkpoint inhibitors. But there's lots of ways to modulate the immune system. So we have agonists that stimulate immune activity um, directly. We have metabolomic um, medications that will... hopefully create an immunosuppressant environment into an immuno-good, um, I guess, an environment. And then we see other things that will target the tired immune system, such as TIM3 in particular. So we at Lilly Oncology are going to make a play in all of those areas. But more importantly, we're thinking about getting the right drug to the right patient and the right disease. And so We now know that the initial successes of immuno-oncology we saw at this weekend's meeting, some not so positive, they weren't negative, they just didn't, um, adding additional combination IO agents didn't add much. So we now know that we're going to have to think carefully about selection factors. So it's not just about talking about getting the right drug to the right patient, but really understanding what that looks like so that we can really expedite that process. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Blackwell. Thank you for having me. What's so interesting about a company like Lilly is that their focus goes beyond developing new cancer drugs. The company made a commitment to help patients with their journey, with the ever-changing emotional and practical needs that go beyond the actual treatment. This commitment focuses on understanding the patient's journey, understanding the patient's and to find ways to help meet those needs. During the annual ASCO meeting, the Lilly hosted an interactive exhibit and reception called Portraits of Resolve, which provided doctors a unique perspective of people living with cancer. We were invited to explore this exhibit, reflecting the experience of people living with cancer through words and pictures, what they look like, how they feel, who they are, and what they're saying. The unyielding and often very determined spirit of the patient was a main theme throughout the reception experience. One of the most striking parts of the exhibit was the area which showed a patient manifesto displaying patients' thoughts in quotes that read things like, I've never tried this hard, but it's worth every effort. I have bad days, but I try to see the glass as half full. My time has never been more valuable, and things may be tough, but I'm not giving up. I can truly say, probably for both of us, that this exhibit, Portraits of Resolve, was an extremely emotional and thought-provoking experience. Reading the patient's quotes and looking at patients' portraits a perfect showcase of patient's voice and perspective. This edition of the Oncozine Brief was originally recorded during the annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, which took place June 1st through 5th in Chicago, Illinois. While we only have time to cover some of the exciting news and abstracts in our program, further coverage of the meeting can be found on our website at oncozine.com. 
For us here at the Oncozine Brief, we want to thank you, our listeners and underwriters, for your ongoing support. Thanks to your support, our program now has a wider reach via distribution on iHeartRadio, in addition to PRX, Public Radio Exchange, and in the United Kingdom and mainland Europe via UK Health Radio. You can also download our program via iTunes. In Arizona, you can listen to the Oncozine Brief via Independent Talk 1100 KFNX, one of the top 10 radio stations in Arizona, reaching almost 5 million people throughout the state. For more information about that, check out our online journal Oncozine at oncozine.com. We know that based on this overview, you may have questions. So please submit your questions to our editorial team via email, Facebook, or Twitter. We'll post as many answers as we can on our website, oncozine.com. That is O-N-C-O-Z-I-N-E dot com. To make this program possible, please visit our page at patreon.com forward slash the Oncozine Brief. Your support for this program is important. It allows us to bring you interviews with experts involved in the development of novel diagnostics and new treatments. So please visit our page on patreon.com forward slash the Oncosin Brief. If you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word cancer, C-A-N-C-E-R, to 66866. And we'll make sure that you'll receive our newsletter, which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. Thank you. Thank you all. And thank you for listening. And join us again for our next episode. I'm Peter Hofland, here with Sonia Portillo, and this is The Youngest in Brief. The Oncazine Brief is produced for Sun Valley Communication by Peter Hofflin, Sonia Portillo, Evan Wint, David Kaler, and Sean Mayer, and distributed by InPress Media Group. Support for the Oncazine Brief comes from listeners of this station and our commercial underwriters and advertisers. For more information about underwriting and sponsoring options, contact Sean Mayer in California at 949 923 1660 or visit our website at oncozine.com forward slash underwriting. The Oncozine Brief contains health and medicine related information and is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended as a substitute for professional medical or health advice and does not replace your doctor's advice. Your doctor is the best person to answer questions about your personal health If you hear something in this program that doesn't agree with what your doctor has told you, ask him or her about it. The Oncocene Brief is in part made possible by generous support from Kite Rocket. Kite Rocket, making brands more valuable. For more information about public relation beyond classic PR support, contact Martin Pirick at Kite Rocket in Phoenix at 602 443-0030 443-0030 or visit their website at kiterocket.com.